using speaking engagements to develop your business and brand with Charles Krugel, episode 136. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit With Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10X Effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another guest episode here on the Profit With Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm actually going to repurpose an interview that we did or had uh, in our Law Firm Growth Summit. So for those of you listeners who are not aware, last December, we ran the first really um, usually successful virtual summit, virtual conference for law firm owners, all focused on the growth of your law firm. It was five days long, and we had 31 speakers at the event. One of the speakers is Charles Krugel, who's also been a past guest here on the podcast. And he is a solo out of the Chicago area and really built his law firm uh, with an international client base purely on uh, doing speaking engagements within the local business community. And it's very fascinating, uh, wonderful uh, session that he did for the summit. And I think that there's a lot of value to unpack that you can use uh, to grow your firm, to increase your uh, visibility and awareness. Now, obviously, in-person speaking engagements are few and far between with the current situation with COVID. So I want to preempt this with saying there's a ton of opportunities to do something similar in the virtual world. I can tell you that there's a huge opportunity to do um, guest podcast interviews be a guest on, on podcast shows where your target market might exist. Um, and there's also a lot of in-person events that are now just going online because they have no choice. So uh, you can still get involved with them in a virtual capacity. And if you are well prepared for that, you have a good camera set up, you have a good mic set up, you have uh, a slide deck prepared that you can share on screen, uh, you have a PDF that they can share with the audience. All of those things are things that are just going to make you a more valuable speaker to somebody who's trying to put on something where they just know that the person that they bring is going to show up prepared, ready to rock the house and ready to move on. So just a, some side notes or 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 you know, pre-notes to the conversation that I'm going to have with Charles and so you can understand how to apply it um, in uh, what you're doing today. Now, some of you might be wondering, so we ran a summit in December. What's next for us? When is our next summit going to happen? And I'm going to start teasing this information out over the next few episodes here on the podcast. But I can tell you that we here at Profit With Law are working really, really hard behind the scenes to bring you an event that you're not going to forget. And um, I'm really excited about the stuff that we're planning and that we're going to be doing. But I can tell you that we want to be different. We wanted to be different when we created the first virtual event last year. And now that everybody is virtual, we want to be different. And no, we're not going to create an in-person event to be different. But we are Uh, We're working hard and heavy behind the scenes to create an event where we can bring you all the features of an in-person event in a virtual environment. So stay tuned on on what that might look like, how we might do that. Um, I'm really excited to share some of the behind the scenes with you as we progress through this, but I can't do that until we're absolutely clear on exactly what it is that we're doing. So uh, there's a lot of uh, really solid ideas that we're running with. But once some decisions are made, I'm going to be able to come at, come here and give you more detailed information. So I, I always think it's, a, it's, it's fun to see what's going on behind the scenes. So I'm going to share that with you. Uh, and this is the first little teaser for you just to know to expect it. So... I'm not going to waste any more of your time. We're going to bring in that recording from the Law Firm Growth Summit, day one, marketing. This is a conversation with Charles Krugel. 
uh, using speaking engagements to develop your business and brand. Here you go. Welcome to another marketing session of the Law Firm Growth Summit. Uh, I am here today, right now, in this session with Charles Krugel. Now, Charles and I met by happenstance through LinkedIn. I connected with him, and then I told him I had a podcast. I asked him if he if he had a story to share. He did. He became a podcast um, interviewee of mine, and I soon came to find out that he does speaking engagements to grow his his firm, and I also found out that he has a LinkedIn group of almost 4,000 um, uh, people in it, uh, law firm owners, uh, attorneys, um, and also um, uh, business clients. So he does uh, business law. And um, the group is, is uh, it, it's actually an active group on LinkedIn. So I invite you to check it out. We're going to share that throughout the, in the episode, I share the name of his group or ask him to give us the name of his group. So I'm not going to try to, to do it right now. Um, but I am going to tell you that Charles is talking to us about using speaking engagements to develop business and brand. And um, he is really good at it. So he's got a lot to share. It's a very actionable interview, and I'm really excited to bring him here to you today uh, and be able to share this. Uh, Charles was a late addition to the speaker lineup. Um, uh, I had just simply forgotten that we had this awesome interview in the past when I was reaching out to people for speaking engagements. And then um, when we were going into promotion mode, I realized that he's got this LinkedIn group and I reached out to him to see if he could promote. And I, at the same time, I had a speaker that backed out and I was able to squeeze Charles into the lineup. And I'm really happy that that happened because... Um, it's an amazing session. And I think that some of you are going to really benefit from learning how to use speaking engagements to grow your firm and, 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 and increase your brand. So uh, with that being said, we're going to cut quickly to an ad from uh, one of our sponsors, uh, and then we'll uh, be right back for um, our session with, uh, with Charles Krugel. GNGF, get noticed, get found. We're a leading marketing agency for law firms, and we literally wrote the book on online law practice strategies. It's our best-selling book, and we're giving it to you absolutely free. Our team does it all from branding and logo design to mobile-first websites so you can meet your clients wherever they are. We back our clients with experts in organic SEO and paid advertising to give you all the analytics and insights you need to grow the business the way you want it to grow. But what makes GNGF unique is our focus on providing a holistic marketing strategy by working directly with the partners of a law firm to tie real business goals to actionable marketing strategies. That's why we're proud GNGF isn't just an award-winning agency with many website, print, and design awards, but we're most proud of being a perennial best place to work and being honored with the Better Business Torch Award for Business Ethics. Get your free book today and get noticed, get found. Welcome to another awesome session here at the Law Firm Growth Summit. I am here with Charles Krugel from the Labor, Charles Krugel Labor and Employment Law on behalf of Business Law Firm. And Charles is going to be talking to us about using speaking engagements to develop business and brand. And I first came to know uh, Charles through LinkedIn. We're both uh, active on there. Charles has a, a very active group on LinkedIn. And... Um, we interviewed him here on the podcast. It was episode 32, You're Never Too Busy to Market Your Firm with Charles Krugel of the Profit With Law podcast. And uh, his story was uh, uh, remarkable as to how he built his firm with speaking engagements. And I'd like to start off with Charles um, uh, letting us know what that um, transformation was, what that path was, and just share a bit of his story so that we can set the stage for um, why you might want to consider speaking engagements, maybe what, what practice areas would be well, uh, well adept at that. Uh, so Charles, welcome to the summit, and I'm going to let you take the floor uh, and say hello to our audience and let them know a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Moshe. I appreciate you having me here, and hello, everybody in the audience. I'm happy and pleased to be here with you to discuss this. Uh, I basically represent companies, small to medium-sized businesses and not-for-profits in labor and employment law-related matters. Uh, a third of my practice is uh, counseling and uh, basically proactive HR counseling advisement on day-to-day HR-related issues. 
Another third is transactional law contracts, agreements, NDAs, hiring and firing agreements. And the final third is litigation, both in state and federal courts and before regulatory agencies like the National Labor Relations Board and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, the way speaking, or speaking, public speaking and presentations is like one major pillar of my business development strategy. And the way this came to me was purely by luck. I was at a networking event many years ago, like maybe 15, 16 years ago at the Paul Center in downtown Chicago. Uh, that's where the Paul Law School is. And I was just standing around with a drink in my hand and I turned around and there's somebody from uh, the, the Community Econ uh, Economic Law Project, uh, the Chicago Law Project. Uh, that's part of the Chicago Lawyers for Committee Under Civil Rights. And she's an attorney there and we just started talking and, and she asked me if I like to do public speaking and presentations. I'm like, sure, you know, this is something uh, I hadn't really done that before and this was something I was looking to do now or with the opportunity, if the right opportunity came to me. And she told me that I'd be presenting at Chicago City Hall, which was kind of remarkable to me because I have no political connections, no uh, people who are like mentors or, uh, you know, uh, who can get me into those types of places. And this was through a third party, the law project. So I said, sure. And I started doing one presentation a year with them and they liked me enough that they started asking me to do two presentations a year. And this was like maybe for the first five, six years. And then maybe about eight years ago or so, uh, they asked me to start doing a series of presentations for a year. And now I've been doing four a year. They referred me over to Goldman Sachs for their small business, their 10K small business initiative. And I was doing presentations for them for a few years too. And it, it, it started snowballing. Other people started picking me up for presentations. They knew I was a public speaker. I got really good turnout for the presentations at City Hall and they were very lively discussions and the, po the feedback was always very positive. So it's, it's something that really came sort of natural organically, but it's worked out. And it's become a major pillar of my uh, business development strategy. Now you're, uh, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection is, is that you are a solo practice, correct? That's right, 18 years now. Yeah, so you have managed to use these speaking engagements to grow your solo practice, but growing a solo practice is it's still you. So that yes. means you've grown your top line. Uh, you've you've been able to um, either uh, get more cases uh, or higher value cases or charge more for your work. So talk to us really briefly about um, the effect that that has had on the actual business side of, of your practice, other than the visibility um, financially, what kind of impact did it have to be getting on these stages? Well, for example, this year it brought me one of my biggest clients. They're a Netherlands based company with significant operations in Chicago and then in other areas around the, well, other areas around the country actually. So California and uh, Iowa. And this was actually through presentations. I met this person Five, maybe six, seven years ago at some presentations he attended for another company actually. And he's uh, at that time and nothing ever happened with it until this year I reached out to him about another matter, not related directly to picking up their business, but it was just some, uh, maybe it was a networking introduction I was looking to make with, for him. And he started asking me questions about what kind of law I do, um, which is something that you have to get used to. You're never, I, I, think, I don't think people are ever going to like really know much about you from the first time they see you or the second time they see you, which was the case with this person. But it took a long, uh, a long dialogue with us and it took like six months until I finally closed the business with him. And that was basically because of presentations I gave about eight years ago. I'm not saying that, you know, this is average or typical, but it's just the way some things go. And like I said, it's a big uh, conglomerate uh, that's based out of the Netherlands. So it's international based business. So before we go into the how-to, which I think is sure. going to be the, the meat and potatoes of our session today, um, comparing this to other marketing initiatives, what, what, is, this, um, is this route free and it's more sweat equity? Is it like what, what, are, the, what are the benefits of going the, the speaking engagement route versus other marketing options out there? I mean, there's everything from billboards to, to online advertising to, you know, uh, there's a lot of marketers here in the summit that are going to be talking about SEO and pay-per-click and, you know, all the, all the fancy Delancey stuff that's going on online right now. Uh, but this is like, you know, going back to, back to the basics and, and, you know, getting speaking engagements and getting in front of physical people. So um, how do we figure out, how, like, how do we weigh that? in the the big picture because i'm sure that there are people who are attending the session that 
just are confused about all the options and trying to figure out which one to choose. So I'm hoping that we can help them uh, figure out if this is for them, uh, you know, and, and the right fit for them. Sure. So first of all, I'm a B2B uh, attorney. And so the presentations I give are always to business owners and operators, HR practitioners, and a lot of times other attorneys. I do a lot of COE, continuing legal education presentations too, and panel presentations with other attorneys and practitioners. Uh, there is a lot of sweat equity in it. Uh, I'm not getting paid for the most part to do these, although this year I did get the upper, I did have the potential for an opportunity in Washington, D.C. to do a paid presentation for an organization, but it just, I, I think my cost was too high for them, at least uh, that's what they told me. Um, there's another company that's based out of the West Coast we're talking about doing some work with. Uh, a lot of webinars too. So yeah, I mean, and compared to, uh, I think a billboard would work for a B2C attorney, but for a B2B attorney, and uh, I, like myself, I think it's really key, especially as a sole practitioner. Marketing for me, or at least in my opinion, marketing is a lot of smoke and mirrors. And this is something that makes me look a lot bigger than what I am. I'm doing presentations at Chicago City Hall. Yeah, they have no political connections. I did presentations at Goldman Sachs. I've done pres or I'm doing presentations still for Westlaw. Uh, I've done presentations for Lexus, Nexus. So uh, a lot of different organizations uh, and companies. And it's, it really raises my profile. The sweat equity aspect of it, I think, is not so much in getting the, the gigs, because once you start getting these engagements, I, I think it's like a snowball effect. But there is a lot of uh, front end work, at least initially, like maybe 10, 15 years ago, on, on getting my presentation materials together. You always need to have good presentation materials, uh, PowerPoints, uh, uh, guidebooks, whatever. And it's not, and honestly, I don't even know if people read these things, but they're there and I post them online on my website and then to my LinkedIn group. So there are multiple opportunities to syndicate this stuff. And the same thing with announcing the presentations. Uh, even if, you know, God forbid I have only one person attend, possibly by advertising it to, uh, you know, to a broader audience that it also raises my profile. And by the way, I've never had one person attend. So yeah. But if I did, I would give the same sort of presentation. Uh, also, the speaking style, I think, is important. I do a lot of q and I talk extemporaneously. I don't lecture. I don't stand behind a podium. Um, I don't really often refer to the handout materials. I let the handout materials speak for themselves. And I find this way that it's uh, very engaged, more engaging for people uh, to do the Q&A type stuff as opposed to like a roundtable discussion as opposed to lecturing. And frankly, if I had a lecture, I'd probably put myself to sleep anyway. So. <laughs> I got you. Um, so I want to go back and just do a quick recap on what you just said. So first of all, you said that because you're B2B, you think that this lends very well to your audience. Yeah. Uh, I would just want to put a quick note on that. Uh, if at, uh, our viewers are, uh, would attend Alexis Katz's session. Um, Alexis Katz teaches estate planning attorneys um, how to uh, grow their practice. And uh, that, that is B2C. And um, her model that she alludes to during, uh, during her talk, which her talk is not about this, but she mentions it. Um, and she mentions that uh, her model is to do two presentations a month. So basically they're sending out mailers to consumers to invite them to a presentation that is informational for them that they might be interested in, which then leads obviously to getting clients. So I do think that um, speaking uh, there, you're creating your own stage, uh, but speaking can work well, even in B2C, uh, there's proof in, in the fact that she's built that model and, and has hundreds of attorneys going through it. So let me uh, com yeah, if go I ahead. comment on that too. Yeah, I agree with you hundred percent because I know a lot of people in the state planning, family law, like divorce type stuff and tax, planning uh, and tax law who do B2C presentations and I see them advertised on billboards or also in the newspapers. So I, I think it's a, a good model for them. One, one also um, aspect of the uh, presentations from my perspective that's uh, really key for me is everybody talks about networking as being an important business development tool. When you're networking though, like in a, at an event or among a group, generally you're one of among many people who are attending. When you're doing a presentation, you're the focus of it. And you're presenting to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, you know, in one case, I think we even had a couple thousand people on a webinar. So it's much different and you're, to, you're talking to a much broader audience. And that's why I say it's like marketing is smoke and mirrors and the presentations make me look bigger than what I am. So. 
Yeah. So um, what I'm hearing you say is that number one, it's, it builds authority instantly. Okay. So putting you on the stage make, makes you the, the figure that people are looking at and saying, okay, he really, he really knows what he's talking about. Right. The okay. second thing is, is that it, in, it engages the audience in a way that, that they are going to remember you. Um, where is, whereas networking is perhaps not as effective. And, um, the, the, the third thing is, is that it gives that in-person connection. So, uh, a lot of the other marketing methods are, um, less personal. They're not getting that face to face time with you. Even if you're doing a webinar, it's still like right now it's virtual, but people who are watching this are getting an affinity to me. They're getting an affinity to you because they're listening to us speak. They're watching us present. Yes. So um, it, it does that. And um, what else did we, what, what were the other key points? Um, it, it, oh, the other thing that I wanted to extract from what you said that I don't think you really harped on is you do a lot of CLEs, which means that you are presenting to attorneys. And I'm assuming that then that means that other attorneys who are not exactly doing what you do are now referring business to you because they know what you do. So it yeah. also creates the referrals from within the, the law practice industry uh, to have uh, business coming your way where it's not necessarily the customer that's finding you or the client that's finding you, but it's the, um, it, it's the attorney that they've already found that's now passing the business your way. Has, are two you finding point, that to be the- Yeah, uh, there's two points along, the, along those lines. First of all, it's a soft sell. And then second of all, what you said about other attorneys, I'm getting between 25%, a quarter and a third of my referrals, uh, client referrals are from other attorneys. And a, a lot of, maybe half of those attorneys attend presentations that I give or are aware of presentations I give. I've had, I, oddly enough, I've had other uh, per, attorneys and providers pick up my materials and then publish those materials, um, you know, or, or even some uh, other like law schools have used my materials too as part of their uh, curriculum which has been kind of interesting to see how that kind of, uh, you know, mushrooms the, uh, the actual materials that I've, I've published from presentations. Yeah. Now I know that you have a very active a group on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who are, who are here, don't even, don't even realize that there are groups on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> Charles has a group of over 4,000. No, it's 30, uh, almost 3,700. Well, it'll be over 4,000 after we mention <laughs> it here. So he's got uh, a group of almost 4,000 people on LinkedIn, and it's a very active group. And um, I'm about to ask him a question about it, but real quick, let's just cover the name of it uh, so sure. people can go and find it and join it if it's, if it's applicable to them. And then after you share the name, my question to you is, is how does owning the group play into the strategy of speaking yeah. engagements or is it a completely separate strategy? All right. The name of the group is Charles Krugel's Labor and Employment Law and Human Resources Practices Group. A very long name and it runs counterintuitive to, uh, you know, the common, uh, uh, the common advice that's given about social media. But then again, I'm a solo practitioner and a lot of what I do runs counter to uh, the common uh, uh, conventional wisdom is what they call it. Yeah, it runs counter conventional wisdom. The same way, you know, I do public speaking at Chicago City Hall without having po critical connections. And it does play a role in business development and in my speaking engagements because I use the LinkedIn group as a means to syndicate or to announce speaking engagements and then also to publish the materials from the speaking engagements. And then people comment on it, uh, they'll borrow it on their own, things like that. So it's, it's a, uh, it's, it plays a key strategy in my social media marketing. Okay, awesome. So um, I think that we did a really good job of setting the stage of, of what this is, what's, what speaking engagements entails, and, um, and why it can be a really good marketing tool for somebody's practice. So we've given them sure. food for thought on whether or not this is something they should do. So I'd like to jump into uh, the how. So real quick, I just want to give a, an overview of what we're going to cover in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to talk about how to obtain speaking engagements. We're going to talk about how to promote the speaking engagements. We're going to talk about how to develop or, or developing handouts and materials. We're going to talk about your style of presentation. And we're going to talk about dealing with difficult questions and disruptions. So let's go right into the first point. Uh, how does somebody go about obtaining um, speaking engagements, especially if they've not done it before? I think asking 
uh, providers like chambers of commerce or business associations, because that's where a lot of business, from my standpoint as a B2B attorney, that's where a lot of businesses congregate. But if you're a B2C attorney, then you want to look at uh, other sorts of groups or uh, maybe uh, parts of chambers of commerce or uh, the types of chambers where uh, consumers might, uh, they go to, uh, they might visit or frequent. Uh, you, also, you have to ask them. I sometimes send around my materials to them. I'll, I'll make a pitch sometimes. I, I don't make pitches that often anymore, but sometimes all I'll do is I'll make a pitch or if I know that they know somebody or maybe they've been referred to me by somebody who I've done presentations for, then I'll send them my materials and make the pitch. Um, a lot of the language I use for the pitch is CAM language, so it's not like I'm making it up, uh, you know, and putting that much more sweat equity into it. It's really, uh, I'm recycling a lot of my materials. The same thing, the same materials for my presentations, I recycle a lot of those materials too. Um, so what was, the, uh, yeah, I want to, I want to add, I want to add to what you just shared. Um, as far as obtaining engagements, uh, one of the things that you might be tempted to do is to look for where you get, might get the most exposure. And when you're first starting out, and I can tell you this from personal experience, uh, from, from not just speaking in, in person in public, but speaking online, when you're first starting out, you want your first couple of engagements to be a small crowd you, because it's going to take a while for you to get comfortable uh, on stage, to get comfortable in front of a crowd. And if you aim for a large crowd to begin with, it's just going to be that much more frightening. It's going to, and, and it, it might deter you from continuing. So uh, one of the things you might want to do is, is really consider how to find a small stage, which could be like a local business networking group or a local, you know, depending on what you're, who you're going after. But if, if you're, if, if you're B2C or you're, you're in, uh, let's say estate planning, you might want to find a financial advisor who hosts a luncheon for their, for their clients and then offer them to do a talk on estate planning for their, for their crowd at that luncheon, which might be a much smaller crowd of you know, 10, 20, 30 people and you start to get comfortable. So I think that um, if you aim low, it'll build on itself from there because then people start to see you see you in action and they and somebody sees you who has a bigger stage and then that's where you know it starts to uh kind of build on itself what do you think um uh, yeah. Charles? a couple of points on that first of all if you're a litigator pub, uh giving presentations and public speaking should be natural for you and if it's not then maybe you shouldn't be doing litigation um and the, and the second point is there are like uh, companies called speakers bureaus, which are sort of a pay to play sort of thing, which um, I think are good, especially if you're a B2C person as opposed to B2B, but also as an, uh, for me as a solo attorney, I'm very careful about vetting any sorts of uh, pitches that I get from the pay to play sort of model. And I've never done that before. I've never done the speakers bureau. I've never done a pay to play thing. So all the presentations I do are free uh, for me. To, I'm not paying anybody to set it up for me. Uh, they set the other. Also, this is really important too. I think other organizations set up my presentations for me. I don't set them up myself. That is to me uh, even a lot more overhead and sweat equity is to set up yourself to get the to get the location, to get uh, food and beverages, and and to do all the advertising. So for like for example, the city of Chicago, they advertise the presentations that they give on their own. And then I could, you know, re syndicate that on my own too, but they set it up. It's in their offices at City Hall. They provide everything else. The same with any other presentation I give uh, for webinars, the infrastructure is provided by the company, Lexus or Westlaw or whatever other companies. Uh, they're engaging me for webinars. So that's the key thing for me is that I don't set it up myself. I'm not responsible for purchasing food and beverages. I'm not responsible for making my own copies of my materials. They do that for me. Um, I'm not going to buy my own paper and do all that type of stuff either. So yeah, this session right here is a perfect example. Um, Charles is a guest here on the Law Firm Growth Summit. We have invested a ton of money um, and a ton of resources to uh, put this on for you. And he has had to do nothing other than show up here at this and this specific time that we're talking together uh, and make sure his lighting and his microphone are yeah. good. So you know it. it um, I, I do like that. Uh, it, there's definitely a place for creating your own events. Um, if you're in estate planning B2C and you, and, and yeah. you need to drum up the business because there's just not enough things happening locally, there's a place for that. Uh, but there's, there's certainly um, 
place opportunities to get on stages that are not uh, your stage, that uh, you don't have to exactly. do all that work. So I think that when you start, it's probably a good idea to do a few of those before you think about doing one of your own. Uh, so I want to move on to our next point because uh, we, we talked about obtaining the speaking engagement. Um, the, the next thing is promoting the speaking engagement. And this is where um, I'm, uh, after what we just talked about, wouldn't it be the job of the event to promote the, the, the speaking engagement, to promote their event? Um, what is your uh, piece of that promotion and why is that important? To me, in my opinion, it's equal. It's 50-50. I mean, normally, though, the people who are setting up the presentation are putting more in than I am. So in all honesty, I mean, maybe, you know, I, I feel like it's, I'm putting in as much, but probably uh, when push comes to shove, when you, you know, you count it, it's not, I'm not putting in as much, but it is key for me to do the promotion too, because the promotion, instead of going out under somebody else's banner is then going out under my banner. And something interesting too, I've seen is that other people start promoting my events for me too. Uh, I met a really good uh, accountant who's a really great networker herself. She, call, she calls herself the dancing accountant in Chicago, and she promotes the events too. And uh, I contacted her once, and I noticed like she was doing that, promoted like three or four of my presentations at Chicago City Hall. And that we, I called the thanker, and she invited me to like a chamber event out in one of the Chicago's neighborhoods. And we started, she referred some business to me after that too, and I tried to refer business back to her now also. So it, it is a key thing for networking. And like I said, uh, you know, it's uh, you're, as I'm a solo practitioner. I'm a big fish in a little. I'm a little fish in a big pond, and this is really a way for me to get out to many more people as opposed to going to networking events and just doing the one-on-one -on -one sort of thing. But it doesn't replace one-on-one -on -one because it does work alongside the one-on-one. -on -one, like I said, in the case of this accountant. So yeah, I want to I want to add to what to what you just said because here in this conversation, I am the other 50%, right? I'm on the other side of the table. Yeah. And I want to share, share with you from the event uh, host um, what, what, it, what a difference it makes to us and, and, and what that means to you. So first of all, 50-50, I don't know if, if, if I would say that that is 50-50 you know, of expense or effort, but, effort. I would say, but I would say that we share responsibility equally on bringing people to the event. So basically the reason that I as a host am asking you to speak is because I believe that by putting you on my stage, I am going to provide value to my audience and also I'm going to attract your people. I'm going to attract people who know you who are now going to show up to my event that I wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. Yeah. So that is the purpose of, of a host putting you on their stage. Um, if you in turn don't promote the event, you're likely not getting another speaking engagement from that provider. Exactly. So, you know, it, I have 30 speakers at this law firm growth summit. I know who's promoting and who isn't. The next time I put it on, who am I asking to come back? Is it going to be the person who drove 100 registrations or is it going to be the person who, who, you know, who provided awesome value but didn't tell anybody about it? You know, and, and I just I leave that answer for you, to, that question for you to answer because I do want to provide value to my audience. That's the purpose of this event. But if I could find somebody who's going to provide an awesome value and promote it, that's who I'm going to be going with. Yes. So that's something to think about is, is it, it's, it's doing for the the event host what is going to help them the most that is therefore going to open additional opportunities for you yeah you can't just reach off of everybody else i mean that's one of the key parts about networking is, is giving back and so the presentations themselves i'm giving back relative to the content but also because it's easy for me to syndicate or to get the word out through my social media channels like my linkedin group and my website and other channels and then other people picking it up for me and then when they pick it up for me to try to get back, to try to give a shout out back to them, uh, that's, it's really key. I'm a small business person. I'm a sole practitioner. I got to promote other small business people. Small business people, small businesses are one of my, are a big part of my clientele. And uh, so it's, it's equally important for me to promote my clients too. And that's one of the ways of doing that. Yeah. So, um, so far we've, we've covered how to obtain speaking engagements, uh, the best way to, to get started and how to think about going, going through that process. And then we've talked about uh, promoting the speaking engagement, why that's important. Uh, we didn't really talk about how to promote it, but you did say that you, you basically syndicated over your social media. And I think that everybody's different as far as where 
where your channels are for promotion. So if you have a connection at the local paper that you can do a PR piece and share that with the local paper and get the promotion out that way, then that's your thing. If you have a LinkedIn group or a Facebook group and you know, then that's your thing. If you have a podcast, that's your thing. So you, you have some sort of channel, even if it's just an email newsletter to your past clients where you can promote um, to somebody uh, the event that you're doing and, or the speaking engagement that you have. Um, so that's really where you should start uh, thinking about uh, going about this. Now, if sure. you don't have any of these channels built, you don't have an audience at all, um, then I think that it's important for you to think about building one. So you need, you need to have a place where you're able to uh, put, your, put your authority out there. It's not just getting on stage, but it's, sure. it's also building that following of people who are actually interested in you. So if you're getting speaking engagements, but you don't have a place for them to follow up with you in, in a forum somewhere, a newsletter to keep up with you in some way, then your speaking engagement will last a very short period of time as far as the effectiveness. So um, real quick, this wasn't one of our key points, but what do you think about that, Charles, um, as far as having a place for, for them to continue to follow with you? Do you, when you do your speaking engagements, do, do you send them there? And is that part of the overall strategy? Yeah, I send them there when I, when I do the one-on-one -on -one networking, especially with other attorneys, I tell them about it. Because the fact is, I, you know, honestly, I could brag about uh, doing presentations at City Hall, at Chicago City Hall. Uh, so yeah, it's it's very important to get uh, that I get the word out any way I can, uh, besides even social media and, and through other channels. It's it's really key. Uh, it's all network marketing and soft sell, and it's it's crucial. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, it, it, one of the key points that you made at the beginning, as far as getting on the stage in the first place that it, it's it's a direct connection it's a personal connection this is all about building personal connections and if there's no way for them to continue that personal connection just think back to friends from your childhood how many friends did you have in elementary school that you still talk to today you know if, if the reason that you don't and you don't barely even remember their names or don't remember their names is because you didn't continue that connection over time um, so you you have to think that way and build that into your your life and your practice and have a method of staying in front of, in front of people and having them remember your name imagine if they get an email once a month from you after your presentation so you got them to give you your email address and now every month you're sending them an email that's informative that's at the at the end of the day whether they're reading it or not they're still seeing your name come through the inbox every month and it just triggers yeah. and they remember oh yeah he's the guy who spoke at this event and you know i remember him and and now when an opportunity arises they're going to remember to come back to you and one th one point to make too and something i started doing over the last few years in my presentations i actually use the presentations to not to when I try to get people there, I tell them that maybe some other people there who they want to meet will be there. And I'll, then I'll make introductions to them like prior to the presentation itself or after the presentation. So I use it to help make networking introductions for other people. It's something that sort of then uh, it, it kind of snowballs and builds upon itself. Um, interestingly enough, I've never had a city official attend my presentations at City Hall, but I found out for my next one coming up, that there will be a city official uh, there um, December 18th. So that's gonna be kind of interesting. Yeah, I wonder what that's going to do for you as well. So we might have to follow up and, and uh, after that happens. And, and if, if, if it actually um, is a positive influence in, in your practice or, or, or further speaking engagements, then I'd like to have you back on the podcast so we can do that follow up with, with our, our audience. Sure. Um, all right, so let's, let's move on to the next uh, point, which is developing handouts and materials. Um, how important are, uh, is it to have handouts and materials when you do a, a talk and, um, and, and what goes into that preparation and how can, how can uh, you do it strategically so that you're not spending all your time preparing for these various speaking engagements? Sure. I don't think the presentation materials are as, as important as your speaking style. Uh, you're there to speak in front of them. You're there not to talk about the presentation materials themselves or not to lecture off the presentation materials. And that's something I actually say at the start of my presentations that I won't lecture off the presentation materials. There's a, that usually like there's a PowerPoint screen or, you know, that they can follow the PowerPoint and then they can ask questions about it. And then they, there's presentation materials with articles that I've written that are part of the materials. And then they could ask questions about that or it's a takeaway for them, you know, when they leave with, and it's got my contact information and all that. Um, there's a lot of, 
work that goes, in, at least on the front end of the presentation materials many years ago, a lot of the materials now I recycle and adapt, uh, you know, to update vernacular or lingo, things like that. But, you know, if I'm doing like a wage an hour, uh, a presentation on wage and hour disputes, overtime, minimum wage, Fair Labor Standards Act type stuff, I'll have a guide as to all the different laws that apply on a state and federal level. And then I'll also have like the various agencies that enforce those laws and the various agencies that investigate complaints. And uh, I'll discuss litigation and, or maybe I'll lay out some war stories that I have about some cases I've, I've handled involving uh, these types of matters. And then always at the end of my presentation materials is a summary of me, a bio, along with a photo of me. So that's always key to have too. Now, are you, are you able to track in any way or, or, or gauge somehow what, what effectiveness that those handouts have? In other words, how many people are going, taking that back to their office and actually putting you in their Rolodex, you know, at joining your group, uh, signing up for your email newsletter if you have one? Um, do you have any idea what, what that um, rate looks like? Because I, I know when, no. when I leave a talk, very often the papers never even make it back to my office. You know, they'll sit in my car, they'll end up in the garbage somewhere. Not that I, I, I it's not important, but uh, for the, for the person, but uh, that was, that was speaking. It's just that um, what, what am I going to do with it after? You know what I mean? So I, I, I'm just wondering if, you know, we had some, some data on that so, so we can highlight that, but I don't track don't, it. That's fine. And honestly, I don't think I, in all honesty, I don't think it has, like I said, I don't think it has that great of an impact. It definitely doesn't have as great of an impact as my presentation and speaking style. But marketing is multiple touches. It takes a lot of uh, points of contact with a prospect to get in the front door and to close the business with them. And it's a, it's a part of that. And I think it's a, in some respects, it is a key element of that. Although it's not as key from the presentation standpoint, it's not as key as public speaking style and presentation style. So it, yeah, it's important and it price touches. It's something when I'm talking with people uh, or emailing back and forth, I could send them the materials themselves, especially if they're asking me, if it's a prospect who's asking me questions about a topic they have given a presentation on. So they know that I'm, uh, I'm sort of, a, a, I'm more of an expert in this area of law, this field, whatever. So yeah, it becomes important, but it's not as important as this, the presentation style or the public speaking style. And it's not, it's never as important as my reputation, uh, you know, with my clients and other attorneys or practitioners and professionals. And we're going to go right into presentation style because it seems like that is a really important topic yeah. for us to talk about. But before we do, I want to share a little ninja trick. So um, I don't know how many of you are active on LinkedIn, but LinkedIn, the app on your phone, the, the, the mobile app, whether you have an Android or an iOS, has a feature called Find Nearby. And if you're not familiar with it, when you go into the app and you go to the people icon and you, and you choose to add a person, one of the options you have is to turn on Find Nearby. And Find Nearby will actually um, put out a beacon from your phone to people near you to say, hey, I'm in this room with you. And then they can go and click connect and vice versa, you can do that. But as a speaker, one of the things that you can do is when you get on stage, you can say, look, I, um, I, I'd love to connect with each of you and, and, and stay connected after this event. Um, I'm active on LinkedIn. Um, for any of you that, that are active on, on LinkedIn and have the LinkedIn app on your phone, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my phone into Find Nearby. Here's how you do it. Um, and please connect with me so that we can follow up after the event. And what happens is you might walk away with a number of new one-on-one -on -one connections from that event that you might not have even been able to, to touch base with while you were there. But now you can have a follow-up plan where you can directly message them. If you have a group, you can invite them into the group. Um, and then they're there. And now when you post on social, they're connected with you. They're going to start seeing your posts and, and you build that relationship. So um, there, are, there are other tools that you can use, but that's a really easy one to use in a networking event uh, when you're on stage uh, to cre create those connections. I wasn't aware of Find Nearby. So I, I, I do talk about LinkedIn at my presentations, you know, my group, I mentioned it, but I, I wasn't aware of that. Thanks. That's, a, that's an amazing point. Thank yeah. You. So try it. I wonder, I'd, I'd like to see how that works for you. Um, okay. Presentation style. Uh, Charles, take, take it away. Talk to us about the style of presentation, different styles. What style is, is best? Is there, is there a best style? Is it just what's best for you? I think it's what's best for you is it's what's best, what works best with your personality. 
frankly, but what works best for me is I could say in one word, extemporaneous. Um, I just speak kind of off the off the cuff, you know, off my, um, with from my gut. I don't lecture. Uh, like I said, I, if I had a lecture, I may even put myself to sleep. So it's not, I just don't like lectures. I've been to law school, grad school, college. I've had enough of that. Um, this is more, much more engaging. It's also, um, it's, it also helps me with my litigation style because it, it's talking extemporaneously and that's something I have to do in front of judges, arbitrators and other regulatory agencies. So it kind of works, uh, one hand washes the other in that respect. So I, I just stand in front of people. There's no podium, I don't, I don't use that. Um, I stand in front of them. I sometimes work, walk among the crowd, uh, back and forth, side to side. Because if somebody asks me a question from one side of the room, then I drift over to that side of the room. And then if they ask a question from another side of the room, um, I'll drift back to that side of the room. I, tell, I ask people to raise their hands if they have a question. And if a lot of people raise their hands, and I acknowledge, each, I try to acknowledge all of them and say, I'll get to you in a second. I'll get, I'll get to you in a second. I'll get to you in a second. If somebody interrupts, I interrupt, I let it go. Um, I tell people they can interrupt me. That's a key thing. I don't, it doesn't bother me if people interrupt me. Um, it's, it's, because frankly, it helps me focus on what's relevant to them. And if I'm talking over their heads, it's just going to be a terrible presentation. So I tell them, interrupt me, because especially if I start going far afield of what they want to learn or what they want to hear about, then they, it helps me if they focus me back in on the uh, unrelevant t uh, subject matter. Yeah, that's a good point. And you have a sense of humor, too. Yeah. And, and what about involving the audience? You mentioned that you prefer the Q&A style, which yes. I imagine has a, a very heavy audience involvement. But if you're doing a presentation that's not Q&A style, do you have any tips on, on how to involve the audience so that they're not sleeping at the wheel there? Yeah, sometimes I have to like cajole them and you know, I'll sit there, I'm like, I'm practically begging. I'm like, come on, I'm like, you gotta have something you wanna know about this, you gotta, and then maybe I'll just throw off topics off the top of my head. You wanna know about this, you know, sexual harassment, Do you wanna know how to conduct an investigation, how to write a job description, how to, uh, to conduct a job interview, things like that. And then, you know, anything to kind of spur discussion. And usually once, I mean, it, I would say about half my presentations, People don't start off initially asking questions. I have to really sort of cajole them, coerce them into doing that. And then once I get past that uh, barrier, then things start to roll. That happened at my last presentation on social media where it was a very large crowd, but it, it took a, a five, 10 minutes to get people into questions. But by the time we were in this, into the second half of the presentation, it was like a kind of a free-for-all discussion, which was cool. I mean, that was great. Yeah. And, and you know, I, what I find, and, and for me, I do a lot of my stuff online. So for, so my experience is people commenting like on a Facebook live or people, you know, and um, you can be there and there's people there and nobody's commenting and it feels dead and it's not a good feeling. And when you're in person and you have the same thing, it's, it's not a good feeling knowing that you've got all these people in front of you and you just can't elicit a response. So what I find, uh, what I do on, on, in those moments is I ask a question that everybody knows the answer to. So I might say, you know, raise your hand if you're if you're if you're native here in Chicago, uh, you know, raise your hand if you're if you're a practicing attorney, raise, you know, like something that you'll get most of the room who, you know, know your crowd and you'll get them get a response out of them because it breaks the ice and it gets them used to responding to you. And now the next question you ask, they're going to be more comfortable yeah. raising their hand asking so if if you're if it's dead if you're not getting responses you can always go back to a basic question um and and you know adding humor into it is fine you know if you want to just you know uh throw age into the mix or throw you know um your something about your religion or you know it, it could be completely off topic yeah. and just just to get people you know to pay attention and be like oh wait where where is this going um yeah. Being self-reviewing, I think reviewing something about yourself personal that people wouldn't normally get from, uh, you know, a conversation with you is important and it helps to it helps you to relate to them. Pop culture references. Fortunately for me, because it's a workplace, I do workplace type stuff. The Office is the most popular show on Netflix and is uh, one of the more popular shows on basic cable. So a lot of people know The Office, so it's easy to talk about, you know, things that Michael Scott would say that everybody shouldn't do you know, things like that, or to talk about cases I've handled, especially cases within the city of Chicago and, and dealing with regulatory agencies in Illinois, because everybody I think has had, whether they're consumer or business owners, had some sort of interaction with a regulatory agency. So, you know, discussing those types of stories is important. 
uh, how, you know, the fact that I get frustrated talking with regulatory agencies, or sometimes I get frustrated talking with judges or arbitrators and, and how I handle that frustration, or, or sometimes how I will even, um, you know, almost yell at a judge, or uh, I've done that before. So, you know, and discuss that judges and arbitrators and all these people, the regulatory agencies, they're human beings too, although half the time they don't seem like it, but, you know, you, you try to relate, relate those stories to them, and that kind of gets the uh, conversation flowing better too. Yeah, absolutely. And and I just want to go back to one word that you said, which is stories. Um, stories are, are really important. Yeah. Stories attract people. They, they res people resonate with them. They're able to put themselves into the story. They're able to, to, to um, uh, create that affinity with a character in a story. So uh, the more stories you can put into your talk, uh, the more engaging your talk would be. Yes. So, uh, you know, always, always think about how you can relate back to a story, whether it's a personal story or just a story you've heard somewhere um, that you can throw in. Um, all right, Chuck, as we're getting to, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I called him Chuck. So Charles Chuck's fine. goes by that. It <laughs> goes by Chuck as well. Um, as we're getting into the final moments of this session, I want to go to uh, what happens if somebody asks you a difficult question? What what, do you answer it? Do you, uh, do you just tell them that that's beyond the scope of, of your talk? Like, what, how do you handle that? Um, and where do you take it? There's a few ways. First of all, if I don't know the answer to something, I just say I don't know the answer. Um, it's not in my area of expertise, and I really, I'm not going to guess. Uh, maybe I could tell them uh, how to formulate a search for Google if, they wanna, if they're really interested and want to check it out themselves. If it's, if it's something that I know the answer to and is off topic, I'll say it's off topic and, you know, so I'll, I'll answer the question really quickly, succinctly, but I'll also uh, qualify it by saying now, you know, I'd like to get back on the topic because other people there may not want to discuss this other, you know, the question that they had, but I never like to blow it off. Um, and I never like to act arrogant and say, I won't answer that. Um, you know, that's, there's always, uh, there's always some sort of answer that is, um, you know, that's congenial, amiable, and uh, it helps to engage, further engage the audience. So I try now, to do that. Now, do you ever tell them, uh, uh, you know, give them that brief answer and explain that it's off topic, but a, a longer answer um, would be appropriate and then invite them to find you after the session to talk yeah. about it or to connect exactly. with you? Okay, yeah, I perfect. tell people that I, I stick around after my presentations for a while. In fact, I stick around for as long as people will stick around. So if there's people there half hour after a presentation, I'll stick around and talk with them. Because you never, honestly, I just never know where referrals and business will come from. And a lot of these presentations, I'm talking with people at sort of like a ground floor level. They're just starting a business or thinking about starting a business. And for me, this is one way to start engaging them uh, as opposed to where they try to find an attorney off of Google or uh, Yellow Pages or whatever else. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Never um, be, and, uh, sorry, never... I, I never be mean, and uh, just like I interrupted you, I try to never interrupt them. So uh, this is that's one of those uh, do as I say, not do as I do sort of things. Gotcha. Um, and then just disruptions, uh, coughing, sneezing, phone ringing. What is there anything to do about that? Does it throw you off your game, and and how do you overcome it? Uh, do you say anything to the people? Uh, I, I imagine that like something like cell phones, that's a matter of building a habit of asking people at the beginning to be respectful of everyone else in the room and please put their phones on vibrate or silent. Um, what what uh, keep what uh, ideas do you have there to share with with us? Sure. So fortunately for me, other organizations set up my presentations for me. So they'll be the ones who are like the cell phone police, at least at the start. So I don't mess with that uh, myself. And also, let's face it, I mean, people get emergencies, things like that, or sometimes they lose interest for a couple minutes and they, you know, they'll drift away and check out their cell phone, and then they'll come back. And in all honesty, and I'm embarrassed to say this, I've even seen some people in the front row of presentations fall asleep. Uh, so, you know, it's... Uh, Frankly, I, I used to fall asleep at lectures too, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, sympathetic to that and I let it go. I've even made some jokes to them like, you know, sorry if I scared you there, I, I scared you back into consciousness, you know, things like that. Um, if somebody's sneezing a lot, I'll say gesundheit. Um, if somebody is coughing a lot, I may say, you know, hey, you might want to exit the room because none of the rest of us don't want to get sick. And, uh, I don't want to be responsible for that. And frankly, I don't want the last thing somebody remembering about attending my presentation is that they got sick at the presentation. So, you know, can you step out for a few minutes and then come back? Uh, people come in late. 
the interesting, one of the things I, st I do with people coming late is, and I, I don't mind, it doesn't bother me, but um, I'll make sure that they get my presentation materials because they might walk past the table or walk past where it's, the uh, presentation materials are at. So I'll make sure that they get the presentation materials. And sometimes I'll even go into the audience and personally hand it to them myself. Uh, that's one way for me to further engage the audience is to, you know, to walk among the audience then and give them the materials. Right. Um, I've had people bring in children, uh, like their kids, and I recognize that, you know, people are working parents or working guardians and or siblings, you know, they'll bring their sister or brother and, uh, you know, they'll bring a service dog. Um, that's fine. I mean, you know, whatever works for them works for them as long as they're in, attending and, you know, asking me some questions, I really don't care. Uh, about that type of stuff. If there's a major disruption, um, I've never had a major disruption like violence or like threats or anything like that. That's never happened. But you know, one of the things I try to promote about my style and myself as an attorney is that I'm a leader. Mm -hmm. And I think being a, an effective leader is also part of being an effective presenter. And you have to sort of to some extent, take control of the audience, but honest, you know, but obviously with a Q and A sort of presentation, you're not taking control. I think what you're doing is somewhat directing the flow more than anything else. Uh, sort of like a quarterback, you know, an NFL quarterback maybe is a good analogy. So, you know, I'm trying to control the flow to the, you know, so if things start getting far afield discussion wise, and I'll say, hey, can we get back to the topic? Especially if I start, pe I, I sometimes see people who are getting upset with other, other people in the audience. And, you know, I'm sensitive to that. I try to recognize that. And then, you know, I'll see that, okay, if I don't, if, if this keeps going this way, I may lose control of the entire presentation. So. Yeah. So I, I think what, what I'm hearing you say is that it's really important to be in tune with the audience and in tune exactly. with uh, what's going on around you. And that could be very difficult when you're trying to focus on your subject matter and, and delivering it uh, in, in, a, in a good and effective way, which goes back to my point much earlier in the session. Start small because these are skills you're going to build over time. And although some of you may be litigators, which Charles has indicated would mean that you already are a natural at public speaking, you're comfortable in the front of the room. Uh, but at the same time, speaking in front of a room like this is different than in the courtroom. And um, it's, you know, there are these components of reading the audience and, and, uh, and, and paying attention to what's going on that takes getting used to. And uh, one of the things, there's a, a group called Toastmasters, yeah. which uh, allows you to go and practice your speaking skills and, 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 and helps teach you uh, how to uh, be more engaging, how to uh, properly uh, you know, engage the audience and, and pay attention to these things and the body language you use and stuff like that. Uh, there's also speaking coaches. So if you're starting to drive some significant business from uh, public speaking, then maybe it's worthwhile investing in a speaking coach who can t really take your, your speaking and, and, and your, the way that you present and the way that you present yourself to, to another level um, and, and really uh, polish it up. And, and, and it could, you know, if, if that's your main marketing thing, then maybe that's where your marketing dollars are getting spent uh, is in improving uh, your stage presence. So I've, I've never ahead, done Charles. Toastmasters, but I have heard outstanding things from everybody who's I I know who's been involved with them. So yeah, and and uh, the, you you've done a ton of learning from experience. I'm sure. I, I, I my guess is that where you are today you, is a totally different uh, presenter than you were when you first started. To an extent, um, I think I'm looser than when I first started. Looser, like more comfortable. Um, but even then, when I first started doing them. Uh, I was a little bit, uh, yeah, maybe I was a little bit stiffer. Uh, one, one also uh, tactic I'd like to mention, and this, I don't do this at all my presentations, I do this at maybe a third to a half of my presentations, is ask the audience to introduce themselves. Ask the audience to say who, who they work for, where they work for, what they do, because that helps me focus it too. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that could be a very important uh, tactic at presentations. Okay, awesome. So we're we're at the we're at the end of the of the session here. We covered our five uh, main points. Uh, once you chose that this is a marketing tactic for you, that you want to do presentations, uh, you want to do public speaking. This is the thing that is going to help you build your relationships and move your your law practice forward, build your business. Um, and we covered obtaining the engagements, promoting the speaking engagements, developing your handouts and materials. We covered your presentation style and dealing with difficult questions and, inter and interruptions. Um, Charles, 
for somebody who has sat through this session and, and really wants to, to make this a focal point of their 2020 marketing efforts, what is one key piece of advice that you can share with them as they get started on this journey? Uh, be persistent, don't give up, but also don't be obnoxious and rude. Because uh, if you're obnoxious and rude trying to pitch a presentation, uh, the people you're pitching to are going to think you're going to be obnoxious and rude in front of the audience. So you really want to be careful about that. Uh, and you want to counter that also with being true to yourself, uh, you know, being comfortable with your own personality, being comfortable in your own skin, and then letting it, you know, letting that all hang out at the presentation itself. Yeah. And, and I love that. I, lo I love that advice. And, and that triggered one thing for me. And that is um, when you're, when you're looking um, to book your first presentations, don't forget your existing network. Uh, your existing network probably knows somebody who's got a stage for you to be on. Uh, so reach out to your existing network and say, Hey, this is something I'm going to be doing. This is the list of topics that I can do it on. If you know uh, any opportunities for me to, you know, to get in front of people, uh, I would appreciate if you made the introduction. Yeah. Uh, that could be an easy way to, to get your first, land, land your Definitely. first few gigs. Um, all right, so uh, I wanna share with you how to follow up with Charles after this and a uh, quick announcement and then we will wrap it up. So uh, charlesakrugel.com is his website. Uh, if you want to connect with him um, and um, send business his way, uh, get his advice on anything, connect with him there uh, as well. He's very active on LinkedIn. His LinkedIn group is Charles Krugel's Labor and Employment Law and Human Resources Practices Group. And um, Charles, thank you so much for an, an amazing session. Uh, it, I, I think this was actionable. It was information, information packed. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I hope that you did as presenting it as well. I always uh, like to hear myself talk most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fit, that's awesome. my hobby. <laughs> Well, that's, that, maybe that's the, the number one key that we didn't talk about. If you like to hear yourself talk, this is the thing for you. And if you I don't, don't know about then... that, actually. That, <laughs> that might be then, because uh, then you'll come across as conceited and self-centered, and that's probably not the, the image you want to present, uh, you want to portray as a presenter, so. Yeah. Um, so some housekeeping stuff. Um, every night we do a live Q&A. Uh, some of our speakers are panelists on that Q&A. So tonight, um, uh, what is the time? 9 p.m. Eastern is the Q&A uh, session. And uh, you can post your questions. There's a thread in the Facebook group for today's track. You can post your questions there in advance. Whether Even if you can't make it live, uh, we'll cover those questions that are posted there. And then if you can make it live, you can ask your question live and have it answered live. So we invite you to attend our live panel tonight. And if you're watching this on, on the replay through the All Access Pass, obviously you've missed that, but the Q&A is recorded in there for you. Uh, so once again, Charles, thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Moshe. we are going to, I'll catch you on a follow-up on the podcast because I can't wait to hear the update on uh, your public official and using the, <laughs> the find nearby feature on LinkedIn. Yeah. So yeah. we've got some things to cover uh, in a follow-up episode. So if you're not subscribed to the podcast, Profit With Law, search in any uh, podcast directory, you'll find us. Thank you for tuning into the Profit With Law podcast. Your feedback is extremely valuable to us as well as helping us us reach more people with this valuable content. Please leave us a rating and review in your favorite podcast directory. Join us again next time when we are back with even more strategies to profit with law.